Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 308, the fellows are pulled back into talking about Roth conversions, specifically the backdoor Roth IRA, its withdrawal rules for David, and the mechanics of the mega backdoor Roth, or dump truck Roth, for Eric. Plus, can Jim still contribute to a Roth even though he did a rollover? How does Johnny G calculate Roth conversion taxes due to the pro rata rule? Also, calculating retirement numbers for a long retirement or by age for Mick and Will, and a radical portfolio rebalance for Craig's dad. Plus, the fellas explain for Perry in Jersey why basis, gains, and losses are tracked. Finally, how much does your financial advisor's location matter? The fellas answer that question for Tom in Chicago, along with a discussion about donating stock upon death. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. David writes in, Alan, ha ha! I always love when Joe trips up on the emails. <laughs> That's never happened. I'm the yo. The years old guy. Remember that? Yeah, yeah David. David. Right. Yeah. yeah. Joe was right. I know I was right. <laughs> I don't know what I'm right about. That, that yo meant years old. That you knew what yo meant. And yo. that he was and that he was the yo guy. What's up, yo? It's like the third time he's emailed us. Yo! What up, yo? <laughs> Next question is, yo, Joe, first billing as demanded. Ha. He's a very ha-ha kind he of guy, is. right? Yeah. You know? He's one of those guys that likes to laugh at his own jokes. No. Yeah. He loves it. And Andy, ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, NL. I had to reduce the spacing so Joe won't get confused. Okay. Yeah, you, you put us on three different lines. Got it. I understand. And now. indents for Andy and even further indent for me. There you go. I have a question about my backdoor Roth IRA. Don't get mad. This one is very different. Although you probably ranted about how every question is the same. I'm confused on withdrawing my con uh, contributions for my Roth IRA um, for my exact situation. I'm using after-tax money from my paycheck and contributing to an IRA. I then select not to withhold taxes and use that back doggy door to convert it into a Roth IRA. I am 35 and started this in 2019. Can I pull out my contributions if I have an emergency? Non-deductible IRA contributions. He converts them into a Roth IRA. You will have access to those dollars, David, after five years. Because it is a conversion sure. into a Roth, then you have full access to the converted dollars anytime once you, um, what, he started that in 2019, so five, yeah. so 2024. Yeah, and that's uh, that's a good point because a, a backdoor Roth is different than a Roth contribution. A Roth contribution, when you put the money in, you could withdraw it the next day. No harm, no foul, no penalty, right? As long as you're not taking out any growth and in income. But a backdoor Roth is actually a Roth, a, an the IRA, IRA conversion. contribution mm -hmm. that you convert. It's a conversion, which means if you're under 59 and a half, you have to wait five years for every single conversion to have access to the principal on the conversion, call it the $6,000, for example. And you'd have to wait till 59 and a half to pull out the income and growth. I'm trying to do this to reduce my cash emergency fund. I'm currently sitting on six months of um, expenses, including two rental property expenses. It is very unlikely two renters would stop paying at once. So I'm thinking I can present the Roth IRA contribution money to my big boss, my wife, as a last resort emergency money. Thank you for all the open discussion and laughs. The big boss. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a big boss. I thought you did. I'm my own big boss. <laughs> I thought you were working on it. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> let's, um, yeah, I don't know. Just do your own thing, David. You don't need to ask the big boss. Just do <laughs> this it. This is why you don't have one, Joe. <laughs> what happens? That's my advice. Yeah, there you go. Um, no, it's not an emergency fund because you got to wait five years. So um, sorry to burst your bubble, but I would still look at doing it. You got two rent. Well, the likelihood of two renters blowing out. Yeah, I asked Alan about that some other time. It happens. <laughs> we got Eric from Las Vegas, Nevada. Hey, guys, and Andy. 
I'm getting mixed signals regarding the mega backdoor Roth conversion strategy. Sorry. <laughs> Please clarify, uh, clarify, how long should I wait to convert the after-tax contributions in my 401k to either my Roth 401k or my Roth IRA to avoid the 6% excise tax penalty? Yeah, boy. Eric from Las Vegas is reading all sorts of stuff. <laughs> you're mixing and matching things. You Eric. got mixed <laughs> signals. Yes, your signals are all tuned in Tokyo. Come on, Eric. Um, all right, let's a couple things. A backdoor Roth conversion. Once again, he's 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 doing the mega backdoor. This is the mega. This is where you do it to the 401k. All right. So <laughs> I think people don't even know what the hell the I, mega backdoor Roth is. Wait. If, there's yeah. so many plans. There's not that many plans that allows after tax contributions. True. If Eric, you have a 401k plan that allows after tax contributions. Okay. So you made after tax contributions. You take those after tax contributions from your 401k, convert those after tax contributions into a Roth IRA. That is called a conversion. There would be no tax. Why people call this stupid thing the mega back door, barn door, doggy board, whatever <laughs> door, is that it's more than you can put in as a regular contribution, right? Yep, that's right. A regular contribution is $6,000, and a backdoor Roth contribution is you contribute $6,000 to an IRA, and then you convert that. And that's all you can do. Now, when it comes to 401k, you have money withheld from your paycheck. You generally get a, a deduction on your on your pay so you pay less taxes but when you fill that thing up 19,500 some plans not many but some plans allow you to put more money in after tax money money that you've already paid tax on so that's what we're talking about if your plan allows that and you put the money in then you can turn around and take that money and convert it to a Roth so now all the future growth in that after tax part is tax free the 6% excise tax is when you you just dump a bunch of a money, of money into a rock that you shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, I want to do a dump truck rock. I'm going to take my two hundred thousand dollar brokerage account. Let's put that in the rock. <laughs> How'd you get that? I don't know. I just wanted to. You talked about a mega. Let's do a dump truck one. <laughs> yeah. So I got two hundred thousand laying around. I thought I'd just throw it into a Roth IRA. Yeah, I, you know, I listen to this, this show called Your Money, Your Wealth. That's all they talk about is mega backdoor Roths. So the thing is, you can only put money into a Roth when you are allowed to. There's certain ways. There's it's a rules. contribution or a conversion. Those You can't just do it. And if you put money into Roth that you shouldn't, then you get the then you 6%. Get the 6%. And, okay. and sometimes this happens to well-meaning people. They put $6,000 into Roth and lo and behold, year by year end, they make too much money to qualify. So the IRS says till October 15th of the following year, you can pull the money out without paying the excise tax. But if you go past October 15th, you got to pay that 6% tax each and every year that you keep that, that, that Roth amount in there that you, sh you weren't allowed to contribute. So right now, the, the, for 2021, Al, the, the income limitation for Roth IRA contributions is what? Yeah, it's it's, it's 6000 No, no, no. Income. Oh, income. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So that for single, it is 137, 147. Got to find it. One, one between 125 and 140. 125 and 140. All right. So if you make over $140,000, if you're single, Eric, then you don't qualify for a Roth IRA contribution, which is only $6,000 or 7,000 if you're over 50. That's the max amount you can put into a Roth IRA as a contribution. If you make more than that, then that's where the backdoor stuff comes into play because there is no income limitation to put money into a regular IRA. So you put your $6,000 or $7,000 into an IRA. Because you make $140,000 plus or $200,000 plus as a married person, well, you can't take the tax deduction. So now you have after-tax basis in the IRA. Then you convert that into a Roth IRA. There's basis, so there's no double tax. There's no tax. You never got a deduction. So there's no tax on the conversion. 
So now the money is sitting in the Roth, but you can only do that with $7,000. Or if you have a 401k plan that we talked about earlier that allows after-tax contributions, those after-tax contributions can be converted. But double check, because it doesn't sound like he has an after-tax component. That's the that's the biggest key to the mega back door. <laughs> yeah, you have to have that. Otherwise, forget about it. Yes. And most employers don't allow, don't have it. Yeah. So if, if you're just throwing cash above six thousand dollars that from your brokerage account into a Roth, then that's where the excise tax comes from. Yeah, I happen to know of a larger payroll company that does four hundred one k plans that never even heard of after tax contributions, yes. <laughs> and that they're in the business. <laughs> so just be careful just... about this. <laughs> uh, so Eric, hopefully. Um, that, that, that helps because there's no 6% excise tax penalty. Yeah. That's only if you put money into something that you shouldn't have. Another example would be you put, you contribute to an IRA or a Roth IRA and you don't have any earned income and your spouse has no earned income, then you didn't qualify. So you put money in that you shouldn't have. And so that's where the 6% excise tax goes, it comes into play each and every year you leave it in. So let's say you do that, $6,000 goes into the account and you leave it there for 10 years, right? And, and it never grew, right? 6% 6, 6 over 10 years, that would be what, 3,600? 30, yeah. That'd be, your, that'd be your excise tax. And if it's 20 years, your penalty is more than your account. Right. Hello, Joe, Andy in Big L. Jim from Santa Cruz calling. He's got a question that does not involve a Roth conversion. I hope this makes Joe very happy. In the first half of 2020, $2,000 of payroll deductions were deposited into my workplace 401k account. I left that company in July. In August, I rolled those contributions into a per personal Roth IRA. I am 60 years old. Am I still allowed to make a full $7,000 contribution in my Roth account for tax year 2020? Or did the rollover contributions count against the $7,000 yearly maximum? Thanks, as always, for the great show. Jim from Santa Cruz. It's a good question, Jim. It's a great question because it's very confusing for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, he, he put $2,000 into his Roth 401k, left the company, rolled the $2,000 from the Roth 401k into the Roth IRA. Yeah, so does that count as part of your contribution? Uh, yeah, the answer is no. You are good to go. You can still contribute the full $7,000 into the Roth IRA. So a couple things. If you put money into a Roth 401k, that does not affect your Roth contribution. And if you do a rollover from your uh, 401k Roth into a Roth, that does not count either. So you're good either way. Johnny G writes in, hello, Joe, Big Allen, Andy, writing back in. I'm 27 and started my new business last year and not paying myself much this year. Uh, so I'll be in the 12% tax bracket. I have one of your favorite questions, Roth and the pro rata rule. I have a 401k in my Roth IRA. Uh, it should be about $30,000 in my simple IRA. Uh, by the time the two-year mark comes due, okay, uh, while well, in this low tax bracket, would it be prudent to convert $30,000 in simple over to the my Roth? I know you all suggest having money in different tax buckets, but I have many more years to save into the pre-tax. and seems like it could be a good idea to get more money into a tax-free bucket while in a low rate. If I should convert, how do I calculate the taxes I owe uh, due to the pro rata rule? You all rock. Keep up the great work. Johnny G. All right. Yeah, convert. Yeah, for sure. Low Convert. tax bracket, you're young, that makes that makes a hundred percent sense. Yeah. And so, the pro rata rule doesn't apply. It's all fully taxable. Correct. So you would pay twelve percent. Um well we I, I would need to know what your taxable income is. Yeah, so it, it depends what bracket it puts you in. So some of it, maybe all, will be taxed in the twelve percent bracket, but some may be taxed more because it may push you into a higher bracket. You might want to do some this year. Some next year? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, if you have a higher tax year, though, next year, yeah. uh, maybe you just do less. But, yeah, you, you want it at the 12% tax bracket at 27 years old. You know, that thing will compound tax-free. I think that would be pretty powerful. 
Stick around to the very end of today's episode to hear the giant derail about Johnny G's dog, Maverick. And hey, David, Eric, Jim, Johnny G, and everyone else asking about Roth contributions and conversions, this is your call to download the ultimate guide to Roth IRAs for free from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. It will explain in depth what a Roth IRA is and how you can benefit from having one, how a Roth IRA differs from a traditional IRA and from a Roth 401 1k the rules for contributing to a Roth Roth conversions and backdoor Roth conversions the rules for taking withdrawals from your Roth account and more click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to download your ultimate guide to Roth IRAs for free and of course if you do still have questions you can click the ask Joe and Al on air banner right there in the show notes and send them in continuing now with your non Roth questions uh, Craig from Chicago writes in, you'll be glad to know that the the word Roth, oh, yeah, you yes. put it like, you know, yeah, like, it's, swear word. like it's, it's a swear bad word. word. Yeah. <laughs> it's nowhere in this question. Thanks, Craig. Craig, we like you already. Craig, love you, buddy. Not that I, I don't love the Roth IRA and the conversions and the back door and the super back door. She's really tired of talking about it. <laughs> How many years have we talked about that? <laughs> That's about 15. <laughs> uh, I took over my father's finances uh, from a friend broker who his of oh of his who uh, my dad in was in questionable investments, MLPs, non-traded REITs, etc. So okay, he's taking over the family finances. I guess he looked at his dad's brokerage account. He's got some uh, questionable investment choices in there. Okay. It's going to be difficult to get out of these, so I'm dealing with the IRA and brokerage accounts first. The IRA is manageable as I can get out of those bad, risky investments without any tax consequences, right? Yes. Anything <laughs> inside a retirement account, you're good to go. You can buy, sell, trade, day trade, do whatever in the retirement accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, whatever. Because they grow tax-deferred, just make sure that you're doing it correctly as you transfer those money into another IRA, that you're not taking distributions. We've seen that in the past. Uh, so my plan there is just to rebalance to the three-fund portfolio at 60-40. Okay. Three-fund portfolio. I think it's like Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, mm -hmm. Total International Index, and a bond fund. That's exactly what he's referring to. Okay. Or Fidelity or whoever. It doesn't matter. All right. Which is a, not a bad, very simple way to go. I, I agree. Um, but the brokerage account is large and 90% invested in individual stocks. I'd like to sell the bulk of the stocks and rebalance into Fidelity no fee mutual funds, ending up at a 60 40 split. But I understand that he will have to pay taxes at least 15% on any gains. Do I understand this right? And is there some strategy to lessen the tax impact of a radical rebalance like this? I drive a Tesla. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. That's good. Uh, not yes. I mean, tax loss harvesting comes to mind, but make sure that you're rebalancing. Just uh, I guess if you're going to take over the family finances, you don't want to blow them up in taxes just to make your life easier, right? <laughs> I mean, if yeah. he's got good investments, you know, keep the ones that are good and then get rid of the ones that are bad. Yeah, I think the way I would think about it is that some of the individual stocks probably that have a bunch of gains. Maybe you, you use those as proxies for an S&P 500 fund, which is not ideal. I understand it's not as, as diversified as you would like. But if it avoids causing a whole bunch of taxation, we don't know how old your dad is. And right now, under current law, when someone passes away, the next generation gets a full step up in basis. So there is no tax problem. So if your dad is 70 and his, his dad lived to 95, then that's probably not going to be a great strategy. On the other hand... If your dad's like my dad, who's 87, I mean, you hate to think about it. Wow. But, but, uh, Morbid. We, <laughs> we don't live forever. <laughs> and even he said, I, I don't know if I want to get to 90. So, <laughs> so yeah, Craig, if your dad's a tip in the toe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm the me. dirt nap. I've got to oh, be realistic God. here, right? Um, yeah. If you can barely fog a mirror, uh, then don't do anything. <laughs> Just hold on. <laughs> Otherwise... Otherwise, do do your best. Just just create some proxies on some of these stocks and try to backfill the best you can. Yes, um, hopefully that helps. Yeah, but you know we've seen that in the past. Like you know, I'm taking over the family finances. Dad's 90, 
and all of a sudden they're selling all this stuff and capital gains happens and, the, and they rebalance yeah. it. But then the old man dies like a couple of weeks later. They could have got a full step up yeah. the basis. No taxes or, due. Or, or mom's about to pass away. She sells all her real estate. So it's simpler for the kids yeah. and pays a bunch of tax that they wouldn't have paid. I got a email here from Mick from San Diego. Hey guys, how much do you change your calculation for retirement savings? If you expect to be retired for a long time. Example, retired at 50, wife and I are the same age, very good health, no kids, modest home in Southern Cal, worth about a million bucks, no mortgage, seven million in savings, 60 stock, 40 bonds, budget 170,000 a year. Can we do this? Adjusted for inflation until we die at age 100. Um, the, the, the numbers look pretty yeah, good. Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> So here's the math. You take the 170,000 a year that you need, divide that into $7 million and you look at your distribution rate, which I, I did that calculation, 2.4%. Okay. So what I would say, Joe, that the, the, the change in the calculation for retirement spending is when you retire younger, it should be something less than a 4%. It should be rate. three. It should be three, two and a half, maybe two and a half or three retiring at 50. And this is 2.4, so this this passes our very simple, quick, easy test. Now you still have to do a lot right because this money's got to last could, for 50 years. Right, it could blow up on them. It could, it's close. Yeah. It's super close. Yeah. Right, because he wants to spend 170 thousand dollars a year, but he's got no mortgage. He needs he has seven million bucks. Right. You know, so one year if he got to spend 150, he man, dial, dial it back a little can, bit. Can you dial it back, bro? <laughs> <laughs> and social security will eventually kick in right so there will be that so yeah i mean mick i think it sounds good but but i mean when we say you're probably okay because you got a 2.4 percent distribution rate you got to invest properly for 50 years right so it, it's like this isn't a slam dunk it looks good on paper but you got to do a lot of things right hello java java the hud <laughs> i would say what joe and andy and Big Al. Oh, Joe, Andy, Big Al, Jabba. Jabba. Jabba the Hutt. Yeah, right. A lot of Star Wars references today, they sure too. sure are. Um, hello. You, you like Darth Vader. That's, your, do. that's I, your favorite. I, I, all of them. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Star Wars. I still think you might have been Chewbacca it's in good. one of the episodes. It could have been. <laughs> I've, I've heard you make the sound <laughs> just like him. <laughs> Can't make it today. <laughs> these th these novels are killing me. These you know everyone's kind of taking advantage of us. Al. Yeah. All right. Enjoyed every minute of episode three hundred. I was so glad that I made the cut. It was a great surprise. Uh, you always provide great, not advice for even complicated scenarios that I think needs to be done through your paid services, even for braggy cough cough millionaires, people that uh, probably should have paid for one. Ah, thanks. Will, that's right. All these people just grinding us, Al, for free advice. Right. Uh, regarding people that have worked hard and saved a lot of money, aside from giving, passing to the heirs, what is the calculation on spending it all at a given age? One of the great boom lately is that younger people are taught how to handle, earn, and grow money. So even if they didn't inherit a lot of money, they can still be millionaires, even with a basic common sense. So say someone would be happy to live to 80 years old. How much can they spend per year if they're 50 years old now to enjoy it themselves? I feel like I'm reading like a haiku or something. <laughs> you are. Um, if he or she happens to live past that, there should still be gain in Social Security, hopefully. Uh, that's all I have for now. Just some random, selfish, grim question. Hope you continue to provide an excellent, informative podcast. In case you missed it, I didn't even mention your favorite topic. Well, I think Andy probably figured it out. She's so smart. Really smart. So that is. That's it. Always will. So that is. That's it. That's so it. So that's it. That's it. That's all, folks. Well, um, so it turns out that the first letter of every paragraph, if we, Andy, it, it says, hey, Roth IRA. So hello, Jabba. Hello, Enjoyed Jabba. every, it's, you always. Yes. Regarding so, yes. people, O for one, T for that's all I have, H, hope you continue, and so on. Very clever. Well, <laughs> he did clever. actually manage to get Roth IRA in there. 
He 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 sure did. I uh, I have no idea what the question was. <laughs> so if you're gonna die at eighty and you start at fifty, how much money can you spend? Is that the question? Yeah, that's the question. Is there like a percentage? <laughs> yeah. We, well, I'll tell, tell you. I'll tell well, you when 50? you're three percent. I'll tell you when you're when you're seventy nine, you can spend a hundred percent of what you have, <laughs> and then you just work backwards from there. <laughs> It it depends. It depends, right? It depends how much you have and what your rate of return is and what the sequence of returns is. It's an impossible question to answer. <laughs> but I like it. It's so bad. I mainly like the haiku. <laughs> hey, Roth IRA. I, I don't think he even paid attention to the question. That he no, was he was just trying to put, get that uh, in there. Exactly. You know, that's that's all for now. <laughs> just a random, selfish, grim question. What the, what well, he had, of... he had to keep adding paragraphs to get the IRA part. Oh, yeah. In case you missed it, and then really smart, always <laughs> will. <laughs> that's I. I mean, the, this I is the one, guy that's that, that siphoned the ga- I, gasoline. I, right, exactly. You could tell the, the, the yeah. That's what you just, thought that he did. That's what no, you came up with, which gasoline. made it so funny. Well, Andy, read <laughs> this email. The guy drinks gasoline <laughs> <laughs> on Friday nights. He is getting hammered on gas. <laughs> It's it's why he doesn't have to spend a lot. He's got free alcohol. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. The, he, yeah. Will's got he's got a gas problem. He's got he's got a problem. So so here's and so I'll, I'll continue. So at 100, I mean, at at, at 79, <laughs> you can spend all of it. At 78, you spend half of what you have. Save the other half for next year. It's 78. Spend a third of it. A third, a third, a third. There you go. 70, just work backwards. Yep. And then you'll finally get to a certain percentage. Yeah, right. How about that? All right. We got to take a break. Thanks for the little high cue. Very clever, Will. Um, always appreciate you writing in. You can see Will's secret message within the transcript of today's podcast by clicking the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app. While you're there, download Big Al's Quick Retirement Calculator Guide to find out how ready you are for retirement. It'll help you ballpark how much income you need from your investment portfolio in retirement. Then click Ask Joe and Al on air in the podcast show notes and send in your situation to get the fellas to spitball it for you. Or skip the entire process and click the big green Get an Assessment button at the top of the page and schedule a free, comprehensive, personalized, one-on-one financial assessment with a certified financial planner on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors. It won't cost you anything, there's no obligation, and it's very likely that they can find ways to get more out of your retirement portfolio and plan. Just click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app and get that process started. All right, we got Perry from Jersey. Uh, live in Jersey. Am I paranoid? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. We'll see. 69, yo. Dog. Schnoodle. Single. Vehicles. He's got a small fleet. Nice. Nice, Perry. Loving it. Uh, I'm. What do you think constitute a small fleet? <laughs> More than one. Probably, probably a car and a motorcycle. I would say it's. I would say more than three. That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> right? I'd say a couple of cars is two. If I have four or I, five I, cars, I I'm a, saying a fleet. I think a car, a motorcycle, and a Vespa. So, <laughs> I'm investing much of my savings with Ameriprise since the IDS days. I'm all too familiar with that company there, Perry from Jersey. That's where I started my career. IDS, American Express Financial Advisors, uh, right there in Minneapolis, Minnesota, home office downtown. I worked in the new Brighton office. So say hello to, you know, Ameriprise Advisor in New Brighton, Minnesota. And I review my account online as expected my non-qualified brokerage account shows much data, including cost basis, in unrealized gain or loss. Question one. Why does my Roth Roth contributory IRA, my Roth conversion IRA, and traditional IRA also track record 40 years of cost basis and unrealized gain loss? Do accounts just love numbers so much that they spend their free time (laughs) recording them? Uh, we, the answer is yes on that one. We do. <laughs> or is the IRS requiring this data for a future tax grab? 
like unrealized <laughs> Roth long-term gains. Why are they keeping track of this historical data? What say you, Big Al? Well, co cost basis, I understand that, because if you're under 59 and a half, you're, you can take out your cost basis, right? It's FIFO tax treatment in a Roth. That's right, but you have to you have to know how much you can take out, and you have to know the cost basis to do that. Once you're over 59 and a half, the only reason cost basis is important is if you just started your Roth IRA and you, you haven't met the five-year clock, right? Yeah. So, so uh, why there's an unrealized gain and loss in a Roth? There's no tax reason. I think that's just for investment tracking. I'm guessing. I don't know. You know what? I think they did. And the, this is a total hypothetical, or um, this is a guess. Okay. <laughs> Well, so is mine. <laughs> I know. Oh boy, um, is they have a system with all of their accounts, and they probably just whether know, it's Roth or not, w w w right? Maybe it's too expensive to shut it off on other accounts, so they just run it on all. Because I know custodians had to change that. I mean, the whole tracking a basis. Um, you know, a few years ago is, is a big deal now with custodians. So yeah. a lot of custodians had to go back and, you know, individuals had to put their cost basis in. And so the IRS came down on these custodians to make sure that they're tracking cost basis appropriately. Um, so, yeah, there is no tax reason from a Roth IRA, but you're right. It's probably to track FIFO tax treatment, first in, first out. What have you contributed? What is the growth? Um, you could take your... Um, your earnings out it, it's last. All, it's also kind of cool to have it, I think. So then you know how much your account appreciated. It's well, not, not taxable, but at least you, you know. Yeah, I suppose in a brokerage account, if you don't have an advisor that's giving you that information, if it's a brokerage account, they probably don't have, you know, here's your annual return. Um, you got to kind of figure it out yourself. Right. And so and here this, it tells you that. Yeah. I mean, I kind of I kind of like that. Well, you're an accountant. Yeah, but I like numbers and I spend my time free time <laughs> recording them. <laughs> Question two. My discharged advisor. What the hell is a discharged advisor? <laughs> fired. Advisor, advisor he fired. Oh, he fired. Yeah. Look at Perry. Or he was, the advisor was discharged of his license because of fraudulent activities. Thing. Got it. My discharged advisor suggested I consolidate my contributory IRA and Roth conversion IRA into a single account. Is this kosher? <laughs> and is there any advantage other than a less lengthy statement, your loyal and obedient servant, Perry. Perry, you're paranoid. <laughs> I mean, he's firing his poor advisor because he asked him, hey, you know what, maybe we should consolidate these two accounts for you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Fired! <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Why do you have cost bases on my Roth IRA? Why, why is there an unrealized gain loss? <laughs> yeah, you're right. So I think I think when he says contributory IRA, he means contributory Roth IRA. Yeah, that's what he means. I Roth contributory what, IRA. I think that's what he means. And right. Roth conversion IRA. And yeah, go ahead and, and consolidate. Make it simpler. What, what, what's the difference? Uh, there's a five-year clock on conversions, and there's a five-year clock on uh, regular Roths, depending on your age, right? So yeah. if you do a conversion, each conversion that you make – into a Roth IRA has its own five-year clock if you're under 59 and a half. Right, and he's 69, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Perry, you're 69, yo. Let it go. Let it go, bro. <laughs> Relax. Maybe hire your discharge advisor back. <laughs> You've been with him for 40 years. Yeah, I never trusted that guy. <laughs> the last and, straw. And now he's telling me to consolidate. <laughs> the last straw. What's his angle? <laughs> <laughs> he's asking me to consolidate my Roths. How dare he? Should I call the SEC on him? <laughs> All right. Joe, Joe's sidekick and Joe's assistant. Ooh. Oh, look at that. How about that? I got demoted. I, I love this dude. <laughs> Who's this? Tom from the Chicago area. Again. All right, Tommy. Still married. Still 60. Still driving my Civic. <laughs> still, <laughs> still working. Still working. Still don't have a retirement dog. Still, <laughs> still running. Even in Chicago, it's cold as hell. Uh, listening to you guys several times a week. I have two questions for Joe, Al, and awesome Andy. Um, <laughs> that's just funny. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, plus he totally stroked your ego. Oh, so yeah, level absolutely. Of Dude, I don't care what he says. <laughs> That's why now he's you can Tommy. You ask me like 15 Roth IRA conversion <laughs> questions, I'll answer every single one of them. Wow, <laughs> oh, folks, now you know the secret. <laughs> Just call me a sidekick oh, and boy. an assistant. Yep. I've heard that there can be tax advantage for heirs if I plan for my estate to donate stock from my IRA to, directly to a charity upon my death. I can see the advantage of donating stock to a charity while I'm alive, which allows the transaction to be free of capital gains for everyone. However, I don't understand the possible advantage for my heirs when I die. Can you explain that if this is true? In any potential perils or entanglements, does it matter if the IRA holdings are in individual stocks or mutual funds? Also, does it matter if my spouse outlives me? Let's pause there. <laughs> So my boy, okay. my boy Tom is getting some advice. And yeah. He's saying, you know what? If you give money to a charity at your death, right. that will save your heirs money in taxes. Yeah. And the answer to that question is true. It, it, it depends. <laughs> well, because they don't have the asset. So they won't pay any taxes. They won't won't pay any ever tax pay any taxes on it. So you don't want to give your assets away <laughs> to avoid taxes. Do you want to pay maybe 20% in tax or give 100% of it away, Tom? So yes, it will save you taxes. Kind. I mean, well, so so let me, let me sort of expand on that because there's two kinds of taxes you could be talking about. One is the estate tax, but that would mean your estate would have to be over 11 and a half million. If you're married, 22. That's correct. So a gigantic estate, if, if you're going to give some assets away, you give your, your IRA assets. But more than likely, most people don't have 11 and a half million per person. Most people, maybe Tom does, but most people don't. And so the reason why you would give your IRA assets to charity is if you want to give money to charity anyway upon your death, You'd rather give them the IRA and give your beneficiaries the non-IRA because that will be less taxing for them. But that's only if you want to give to charity. Right. If you don't want to give to charity, then forget so it. So the IRA has income tax consequences at your death, right? Yep. There's no stretch IRA any longer. So when you pass away, the heirs, the beneficiaries will have to deplete the account within 10 years. So if Tom's got a ton of money in there, you know, then the kids will have to deplete it. It's all ordinary income. So yeah. no matter, I mean, I'm sure Tom's kids are pretty talented, just like Tom is. So yeah, <laughs> they could probably lose a little bit of money in tax. Uh, the other assets would get a full step up in tax basis. Sure. So they could sell those assets right after Tom passes and not pay a dime in tax. Yeah. So so just to, I'll say it, try to say it simply. If you have a certain amount of assets and you want some to go to charity and some to go to your kids, then you would favor the charity getting the IRA assets because then that's taxable. Charity doesn't pay tax on it because they're a nonprofit, but your kids would if they receive it. So you'd rather give your kids the non-IRA assets if you had a choice, if you want to give to charity. Um, does it matter if my spouse outlives me? Well, sure, you would want to name your spouse the beneficiary. If you name the charity the beneficiary, she will have to sign off on that. She doesn't have any of the assets. It just goes to the charity. Right. So um, be careful there. Um, another unrelated question. One other unrelated question. I've also heard that it is advantageous to pick a financial advisor that is based in a state I plan to retire in. Wondering if you have thoughts on that. Perhaps I can ask a Roth conversion question next time. That's what you <laughs> opened it up for him. You told him he could. Anytime, Tom. <laughs> Anytime, Tommy. <laughs> Um, what do you think? Did I pick an advisor on the state you retire in? I don't know. Why does it matter? Yeah, I don't care either. Don't care. The only reason you pick an advisor in your own state is just if you want to see him or her, it'd be more convenient. In person. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. Nowadays with Zoom, it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, the only other advantage I can see is that if I'm an advisor in Illinois versus California, I probably know Illinois tax law a little bit more. And I might understand Illinois estate taxes better too. So, but if yeah. I had a client that lived in Illinois that I was servicing, right. I would be pretty tight on Illinois tax. I probably would learn about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would ask Big Al. <laughs> and I would call some CPA that has nothing to do but record numbers in the spare thing. So it doesn't. Uh, I, here's, here's my advice, Tom. If you want to find an, a good advisor, I would A, Seek out a certified financial planner. Uh, seek out someone that is fee-only. Seek out someone that has expertise in what you're trying to accomplish. 
Um, I, I think the advisor that you're seeking advice from with this whole give your IRA to charity to save money in taxes, you maybe bypass that individual. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. Um, but, yeah. I think I think I, I th also think it's easier to find an advisor in your hometown, get to know that person, and then when you move out of state, you'll already have that relationship. It's a little bit harder. It's not impossible. I mean, we we personally have clients across the country, so it's not impossible. Are you selling Tom to become a client? Not really, uh, but because because he's only going to listen to you because I'm currently just a psychic. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the, the point is, I, I mean, you can meet advisors over Zoom, and we're doing a lot of that ourselves, as are other advisors. But there's something to be said for getting to know a person, having a relationship before you move to another state. So that, that's just one thought. Yeah, but I, the, the relationship is key, of course. But you want to make sure that they're competent. Of course, yeah. I mean, we see a lot of cases that come through our desk. And it's like, wow, this is really bad advice. And it's like, well, I've been with Johnny for 30 years. <laughs> it's like, well, Johnny's not that great of an advisor. Right. Um, so, but yeah, there you have it, folks. Well, we got a very small dent in the emails today. We did. But um, we're, we're working on it. Keep them coming. Go to yourmoneywealth.com if you have a money question. We'll see you all again next week. Derails coming right up. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 and schedule a free financial assessment video call. It doesn't matter where you are in the country, and chances are one of the certified financial planners at Pure will be able to identify strategies that will help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. You gotta do well, I suppose. That one, by the way, he says, hey, Roth IRA in code. If you see the first letter of every sentence. <laughs> I didn't get why the spaces are there, but now I see it. <laughs> Pretty clever, actually. Yeah, it is. All right, you guys ready? He's still reading it. Okay. Uh, all right, <laughs> you, you can explain that one. <laughs> my question was answered in episode 286, and then my good old boy Maverick was brought up in episode 301, and Joe still wanted to know more about Maverick. So here's the story. You've been waiting for the 70s. So Johnny G and Maverick are boys? Yes. I guess so. so. so Maverick Johnny is the dog. Coming in. Oh, Maverick's the dog? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I should continue reading. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you think Maverick I was? thought like Johnny G and Maverick were like friends. Got it. And then Johnny G was like, well, I know the story behind Maverick. Well, and his question about a Roth conversion. Oh, got it. Well, you, your dog is your best friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> got it. But Maverick is a 12-year-old German Shepherd, or short hound, short-haired. Short <laughs> That'd be funny, a short-hounded German Shepherd. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the size of a dachshund. Yes. <laughs> With a German Shepherd head. That'd be cool. <laughs> uh, Weighs 62 pounds, 61.8 pounds to be exact. Uh, he was acquired in the hopes of being a, a good bird hunting dog. But after several thousand dollars in eight weeks at doggy hunting camp, we, we, we picked him up and we're told Maverick will be a good family dog. He got a D and he's been a lovable goofball ever since. Not cut out for bird hunting. Oh. Have you done bird hunting being from Minnesota? Um, like duck hunting, bird hunting? No, yeah, no. no. I've, I've never hunted before. Okay, you fish. I have fished. Yeah, okay. A few times. Not yeah. a big fan. Got I just it. didn't, don't enjoy it. Got it. I went squirrel hunting with my father. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Did you get one? I don't know. It was awful. <laughs> I was yeah. so bored. You know, uh, my grandfather used to love fishing. My father, not so much. And me, yeah, not at all. My kids actually threw a line in the water without a hook, and much to my horror, they caught a fish. <laughs> and they go, here, Dad. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> got to pull this hook out of his mouth. Oh, Blood everywhere. That's not for me either. Yep. Um... Johnny G. All right, in Maverick, the the hunting dog that is no the, longer the family dog. 
you know, that thing will compound tax free. I think that'd be pretty powerful. And then you could buy yourself a real hunting dog. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Show's called Your Money or Wealth. 